Okay, so good morning, good good afternoon, good evening. Thank you very much to join us today for another another uh, very interesting cast talk that will be done by Dr. Ushir Puri from IBM Research. So we are here today to uh, listen to Dr. Ushir Puri. Uh, Dr. Ushir Puri is the chief scientist at IBM Research and the IBM Fellow and Vice President of IBM Technical Community. He led IBM Watson as its CTO and chief architect from 2016 and to 19, and he has held various technical research and engineer leadership roles across IBM's artificial intelligence and the research business. Dr. Puri is a fellow of the IEEE and has been an ACM distinguished speaker and the IEEE distinguished lecturer and was awarded 2014 Asian American Engineer of the Year Rushi has been an adjunct professor at Columbia University, New York, and a visiting scientist at Stanford University, California. He has honored with the John von Neumann Chair at the Institute of Discrete Mathematics at Bonn University, Germany. Dr. Puri is an inventor of over 70 United States patents and has authored over 100 scientific publications on software hardware automation methods, microprocessor design, and optimization algorithms. He is the chair of the AAAI, IAAI conference that focuses on industrial applications of AI. Rush's technical opinions on the adoption of AI by society and business have been featured across New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Fortune, IEEE Spectrum, among others. So this is just a brief uh, short CV of Rushi that is a, a scientist with a long uh, set of achievements. Né? So congratulations and thank you very much again to accept our invitation to give this talk today. So now uh, the floor is with you to start your talk. So uh, you can put your slides in... Uh, full uh, presentation yeah so the, so thank you first of all ricardo for the uh, nice introduction uh, i really appreciate it um, and uh, true to what sort of some of the bio actually said uh, i'm going to really focus on something that is becoming incredibly exciting uh, across the industry uh, in particular what role is AI going to play in the future of software and hardware? Both topics that are very close to this, this community, in particular, the design automation community, the hardware community, the software that runs on that hardware com community, and the hardware software co-design community. Um, so my talk is really going to focus today on, on this future. Uh, and interestingly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become quite hands-on and I'm going to show you a demo actually as well. So this, is not, this will not just be about PowerPoints. It will also be about showing you the power of where AI has come to today and things that are coming to a, a Mac or a, you know, a, a laptop or a, or a computer near you, which is going to disrupt the way we all develop software the way we will develop hardware in the future, specifically from a specification point of view. Uh, how do we uh, specify hardware? Um, I think it's gonna have some very fundamental implications and I'm gonna show you again, as I said, a, a demo as well, sort of what is the art of possible, what is coming near us uh, in the very near future. And I think in, in, it'll be a very interesting decade to watch. So just I think I'm I'm not gonna sort of uh, delve on it too much, but uh, sort of I just want to start this talk with uh, first uh, you know looking towards the future. I would say um, you know, what is coming next. Uh, as I said, the 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 topic of my my talk really is uh, focusing on the future and and what's next. And I would say from a hardware point of view, 
uh, no, this is the, I'm talking to a to a hardware community at this point. Uh, majority of you actually play in that area. Uh, you know, what's next in computing is a very fundamental question. And you know, I would say we are coming from an era where it was the bits that were dominating. You know, I would really say zeros and ones. Uh, the era of bits, the era of uh, computing architectures, RISC, uh, CISC, uh, one Neumann architecture, let's say it that way. Um, we are, for the last, I would say, seven to 10 years, have been in an era uh, which have been defined, I would say, by AI and deep learning. Um, I'll call that era of neurons. And of course, you know, some of that uh, architectures were dominated still by the architectures that are more bits driven. Um, namely GPUs and others, but newer architectures are em emerging of directly addressing uh, neuromorphic computing uh, with uh, newer and exciting accelerator architectures. That's the era I will call of neurons. And we are heading into an era which I'll, you know, in the future, in, in years and decades to come, in an era which will be defined by qubits, uh, also known as quantum bits. So you're coming from you know, the past, if I may say it, is bits, present is neurons, and future is sort of quantum. And what's next in computing is how these three eras will get combined into a new computing paradigm, powerful enough to move the needle between the possible and the impossible. What we believe is impossible today will become possible in the future by combination of these three very powerful technology as we move forward. And that's going to be my discussion today and how it's going to disrupt, uh, how we are going to, you know, how we are going to specify behavior for these machines, how AI can help us in that domain and, and so on. So I think you know, before I really get into, uh, you know, Overall, uh, what's next? Uh, focusing more on the software side. Uh, obviously, enough has been said about neurons and and sort of the evolution that is upon us right now. And I'm not going to focus a whole lot on the quantum, other than talk about it towards the end. Uh, but I really wanted to focus this talk on um, sort of underlying all of this is software. And how we are going to define software, by software, I really mean specifications. Um, in many ways, we specify hardware with software as well. Uh, we write VHDL, we write Verilog, we write C, we write System C, we, we write uh, you know, all kinds of languages, Python and others as well. That's how we specify behavior, whether it is a behavior of a task or whether it is the behavior of a particular hardware. Uh, that we wanted to synthesize, we write behavior through software. And, and again, my focus will be more on in this talk on sort of how do we specify behavior for the machines um, in this new era, which is combining bits, neurons, and qubits together. Okay. So I think it'll be fair to say that uh, you know, software has had a major role in our lives. Um, you know, everything around us is driven by software, whether we see it or not. Uh, right from the point you wake up in the morning, looking at your Alexa to uh, to you know everything else, uh, whether you at your work or otherwise, or transportation or everything else, it's it's driven by software. And I think uh, obviously software has had a major role, uh, but we believe AI will have a major role in software. And you know, one question that I have focused a lot on uh, more recently is, uh, which has interestingly was the was the very th first thing that uh, that when the Dartmouth meeting was held, where the beginnings of artificial intelligence were, were discussed. No, several decades earlier, um, the, when the word artificial intelligence was coined as well, the question that has um, sort of uh, that has uh, uh, fascinated computer scientists is: Can we build computers that can program themselves, or can computers program computers? And 
to really answer that question, I think we need to look into sort of what has happened over last decade. And this is where I'll show you some demos as well, actually. Sort of the art of possible. See what is what, what can be done today. And you could go out, actually, and try these things out yourself. This is not something I'm going to show you proprietary. You can certainly go and try this out and feel the power of it. So, you know, looking at what has happened in last decade, uh, obviously, that was, as I said earlier, that was a decade which was defined by deep neural networks. Um, there were three major things that were responsible uh, for revolution of deep neural networks. I said three major pillars, if I may say it that way. And the first of them was some fundamental advances that were made in um, in algorithms. Okay, I think the algorithms matured enough to a point uh, where, okay, it started looking interesting. Deep neural, net neural networks themselves are not new, but some of the sort of scale of algorithms evolved enough that we could actually deal with, uh, uh, with the complexity of data that was you know, streaming through the world to make sense out of that data. But had it not been because of the underlying hardware, um, we wouldn't have been in the middle of that revolution because algorithms were needed to deal with the large amount of data, but the compute, uh, and in this case, it just ha we happened to stumble upon the fact that you know, matrix manipulation is something that was fundamentally needed for, for AI. And, uh, and looking at this, you know, these three things married together uh, very large data sets coming together um, and uh, married with algorithms and combined with the underlying, you know, phenomenally um, fast compute, uh, which can be scaled as well, parallel and fast compute, um, gave rise to the revolution which we are in the midst of right now. But if you were to ask me, what was the, among those three things, what was the single thing that was, you know, if I were to just pinpoint one thing that was critical in, in, in this revolution, I would say the machine learning revolution is fueled by data. Um, you know, it, AI is nothing without data. Uh, it, it's all about data, actually. And if you look at sort of, if there was a single, I would say, pivotal turning point, uh, which uh, which resulted uh, resulted in the snowballing of of massive uh, uh, innovation unleashing of innovation it was this data set called imagenet uh, many of you may be familiar with it uh, but if you're not please go you know google it you will find enough information on it but it was uh, started by um, Fei Fei Li at uh, at stanford <coughs> and um, you know, she started it, this activity when she was at Princeton, I believe, in 2009, and then, you know, carried, o carried it over at Stanford. Um, when she started, it had roughly around 3 million images. It's a label data set, uh, 5,000 classifications of all kind. And when she was all said and done, um, it was actually 14 million images and 22,000 classifications of all kind, you know, every possible thing you can imagine is, is captured as part of this in some image or the other. Um, and, you know, she, she really farmed it out to the world. This, I would say, will be the first uh, version of what is now, you know, fondly called as crowdsourcing. Uh, she had, uh, you know, the 100, I would, if I remember right, 70 countries or so, uh, 150,000 people sort of really working together in in labeling these images. Um, and this resulted in this massive data set, which unleashed the creativity of many researchers taking this data set and building all kinds of new architectures. And since it was a benchmark, things can be measured. If you can measure things, you can improve things. And this was a single, I would say, you know, among all the things that happened, obviously hardware was important, obviously new algorithms were important, but it all starts with data, which resulted in human level ability on certain narrow tasks, I would say. Uh, so when we started, so when Feifei started this activity, we were standing at roughly around sort of 30% error rate, if I may say, on this particular benchmark. And when all said and done, when the dust actually settled, 
uh, roughly five years later, um, algorithms had achieved uh, better than human accuracy on that benchmark. I want to make sure I qualify this because you know, beating benchmarks is not the only thing. You know, I, I say it many times. Um, human brain is is a, a incredible, uh, you know, if I may call it a machine, incredible machine, because it can it can do hundreds of things at the same time. It is sentient, of course, and and uh, and it can feel, uh, it can uh, it can think, it can make you walk. You are talking at the same time, uh, like hundred things going on at the same time, and and it does all of that uh, at a phenomenally, you know, excellent speed. Uh, while consuming only 20 watts uh, and and being confined in a volume which is 1200 centimeter cube uh, so you know, size of your average head uh, where the brain is confined and and uh, um, as i said consumes 20 watts and runs on sandwiches versus a single gpu consumes 300 watts and doesn't even do you know i would say one th ten thousandths of the thing that a you know, multitude of things that the brain can do so we are far away from this sort of broad AI task, actually, yeah, specifically in terms of energy efficiency and what, what a brain can achieve. Uh, having said that, I think phenomenal progress was made uh, on computer vision tasks. I think that it's clear. And the applications of AI in computer vision and, and uh, in speech and in other snowballed, this led us to certain very phenomenal feats that were achieved in 2011, um, you know, IBM Watson played Jeopardy, the famous match, and defeated the, you know the reigning champions of all times um, in that match, uh, and and you know a phenomenal feat achieved. And more recently, uh, uh, IBM's Project Debater was at the cover of Nature magazine, arguably one of the most popular uh, you know science uh, journal in the world uh, and most influential. Uh, and it's about you know AI or a machine debating humans, uh, some of the best debaters in the world, uh, and, and really giving pros and cons in a, in a very argumentative uh, uh, discussion and arguing its point. Uh, to the point, if you look at you know, things like Lambda and others, uh, which have been talked about more recently, and if you watch that script of 21-page script, which was in New York Times and Washington Post and others, uh, it's like, it's incredible, actually, just incredible. Uh, the level at which that advancement has been made. Now, interestingly, while all of this massive revolution was taking place, uh, you know, as 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 we know it, uh, um, there've been a lot of talk in the world on sort of I would say decaying infrastructure uh, in sort of world's uh, uh, advanced economies, if I may say it that way. Um, you know, they started earlier on the path of uh, industrial revolution and some of those uh, that infrastructure is getting old. And it is not just a physical infrastructure which is getting old, world software infrastructure is getting old as well. Um, and if you look at some of the headlines, interestingly, this is we are still in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, and uh, if you look at some of the headlines, uh, this is right at the beginning of the pandemic. On uh, this is Design News, one of the news uh, sort of sources that uh, this community should be well familiar with. COBOL coders needed for coronavirus fight. Now, I interestingly wouldn't expect COBOL and coronavirus in the same sentence. <coughs> Having said that, I think it's a very interesting statement because the reason that uh, that kind of headline showed up is because. Um, in the beginning, because of pandemic, uh, the, the world shut down. And as the world shut down, the demand for government services went through the roof because the government stepped in. Um, and some of the infrastructure, you know, it stressed the systems, the government systems so much because they were not designed for that kind of demand. Nobody foresaw something, an event like uh, coronavirus to happen for the entire world to shut down at the same time. Um, and that stressed the underlying systems, which interestingly were written at the time for the for the government services, uh, written at the time in, in 1960s, 70s, and, and, and so, when a language called COBOL, uh, one of the earliest languages, uh, was the most popular one. And, and uh, you know, I would say uh, even now, majority of the world's finance actually runs in with, with COBOL. And interestingly, there's nothing wrong with COBOL language itself. 
uh, per se. You know, it's not that it's all broken, and you know, it's it's just the skills to support COBOL and an older language uh, languages is disappearing. <coughs> And that really gives rise to the second headline, which is closing the COBOL programming skills gap. But I would actually, I could remove the COBOL word from there and say, we need to close the programming skills gap, whether it is for hardware, whether it is for software, <coughs> or whether it is for broader purposes, there is a large gap between the skills that are needed for programming and you know to where we have the demand for those skills is very high. The supply for those skills is not as high. And we believe AI can come to the rescue for really helping bridge that gap. And this was an article, this was in 2020, late in 2020, so sort of a year and a half back or so, where I was interviewed at IEEE Spectrum on sort of IBM Watson's next challenge, modernizing legacy code. Again, you can take it, go and take a look at it. But my, my point really is that you know, really help is needed. And AI, we believe AI can really come to the rescue for bridging that gap for programming skills, for specifying behavior to machines, whether it is for hardware or whether it is for software. And I'm going to show you some things, as I said uh, earlier on as well. So let me just step back and say, you know, I would say symbols allow us to acquire, represent, share, and communicate knowledge. Uh, because everything around us is symbols, actually. Uh, so if you look at uh, you know, the, the reason being, you know, so that we can really reason over that knowledge to generate new facts and guide our actions. It's that symbolic representation that differentiates us from other animal species. We as humans really are very sophisticated in our symbolic representation, in our symbolic reasoning and symbolic knowledge capture. This is one of the very fundamental facts of human race as animal species. Um, and interestingly, symbols, uh, really languages are comprised of symbols. Uh, languages have been fundamental symbolic systems through which humans have communicated with each other but there are other kinds of languages too. There is language of chemistry, interestingly, which is comprised of molecules and elements and others. They are symbols, actually. And we combine these symbols in different ways to represent the material world around us. The symbols are stories. We actually write stories with represented with symbols as well. The symbols of imagery, which is choreography and others. And then the one which is very close to us, the symbol of code which is how we communicate with machines and how machines communicate with each other, which is code. And this is the one we are going to sort of really hone down on today in terms of both hardware code, sort of code for hardware and code for software as well. So this is really the, fo the focus that we're going to have today. Now, obviously, we have seen the power of AI applied to human language. Um, you know, as I talked earlier uh, regarding the the language, uh, 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 the performance on computer vision tasks. But obviously, you know, we have applied this to human language in terms of speech performance, uh, achieving superhuman accuracy on certain benchmarks. Again, as well, narrow tasks, certain benchmarks. You have seen the the uh, more recent uh, uh, phenomenal, actually. No discussion to the point. Somebody, you know, the man in in uh, um, in Google thought to, uh, that uh, that the machine had become sentient. I'll, I'll leave that discussion aside for the time being. But I think that, that it'll be fair to say that these machines have have uh, the algorithms and machines have become phenomenal, including you no know, voice and conversation, document understanding, and. Uh, I would say appearing to the point, they can almost pass a Turing test, which is if the machine was behind, behind a curtain and I didn't know, they, they're having kind of a seamless discussion between you as a human and, and this machine. And the conversation is like almost fluid and seamless. <coughs> However, I think uh, if you ask me or, or if you ask anyone, what is the language of machines? I would say, hey, code is the language of machines. 
this is how we communicate with machines and, and also machines communicate with each other. And we believe just like AI has, uh, has helped us master machine, uh, human language, AI can also help us master code as well. NLP and uh, so natural language processing and machine learning for software artifacts. And again, I want to emphasize software artifacts can be for software specification as well as for hardware specification automated reasoning and decision making and all underpinned with explainable AI because these kind of techniques are really consumed by experts, subject matter experts. For example, in the case of hardware, <coughs> hardware designers, and, and we need to have explanation of the results of these techniques. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, because I think that the reason is that uh, that subject matter experts are a very finicky bunch. They don't just trust things because I told you so. So you have to really convey the logic of uh, why you why you are telling them what you are telling them, and this is the really the core area of explainable AI. So AI in itself is not sufficient. It really needs to be trusted <coughs> trusted AI as well. Excuse me. Okay. So uh, you remember I talked about earlier on about really AI and, and what was the pivotal moments in, in the current revolution up to AI. And, and what was the pivotal moment was this benchmark called uh, ImageNet. And, and we also believe, you know, AI for code, um, AI for software needs its ImageNet moment uh, for breakthroughs like code language translation, taking languages like COBOL and translating it into Java as an example, code search retrieval, um, natural language to code, uh, code generation. Uh, so type it in English, you know, new code comes and I'll show you some demos of it interestingly. <clears throat> code similarity. I'm looking at this code. Can you get me code that is similar to this? Uh, code performance improvement. My code doesn't work as well. Can you improve its performance? Code memory improvement. Uh, code classification. What does this code do? Can you summarize this code? And so on. And all of this is kind of uh, with a with lot of work that has gone on. It's kind of becoming a reality at this point. And to really enable and help the research community in such massive tasks, um, we need something like an ImageNet moment for us. And more recently, we, we uh, IBM Research, announced a project called Project CodeNet. It's a high quality code data set for algorithmic, uh, algorithmic innovation and benchmarking. It's the largest data set of its kind. It's got 14 million code samples, 4,000 plus code problems in 55 different programming languages and a half a billion lines of code. I'll emphasize again, half a billion lines of code in 55 different programming languages. Uh, two, it really covers a diverse set of problems and codes. Codes are well tested. So unlike other sort of benchmarks where you say, hey, I could just go on GitHub and go through all the code that I want, but this is a, think of it as a label data set, which it's not just sufficient to compile the code. Uh, it's actually, when, if you're trying to solve a particular task, you know, the, the interesting thing about code is that uh, unlike human language, either code is right or it's wrong. There is no such thing as it's kind of right. Uh, well, there's no kind of right, actually. So you need to have these test sets that go with codes as well, uh, which are provided for each of the problems here in the benchmark as well. And it can become a phenomenally good reinforcement learning tool for you know, breakthrough innovations in AI. And I'm really proud to actually announce that, uh, uh, that this, this largest AI for code open source data set, which is available today for accelerating intersection of AI and software, which we announced last year uh, during summertime. More recently, if you followed the announcements from DeepMind, uh, you know, a, a really a, a leading AI research institution, uh, they announced something called Alpha Code, and Alpha Code used CodeNet as one of its major training data sources, as well. So it is already resulting in some of the breakthrough innovation, and 
And the alpha code is about uh, a machine to be able to compete with human programmers in competitive programming tasks. And it's able to achieve up to like, you know, 50 to 60 percent accuracy on these some very hard problems overall, actually. Uh, so you know, if you want, again, further details on alpha code, you can go and take a look at that paper as well. But it was, again, I think that this data set that we are putting together for certain very broad set of tasks and very high quality data set, which is helping us unleash this innovation, just like ImageNet did it for uh, for uh, for the world of, of uh, computer vision and beyond. <coughs> so the same technologies we have applied to mastering human language, um, as I said earlier, will help us master um, uh, code uh, with a with similar set of technologies from natural language processing, reasoning and decision making and explainable AI. Now, as I said, you know, obviously code is the language of machines, but if I just compare and contrast uh, this language, um, you know, a language and language has multiple dimensions, you know, there are polyglot of languages. Like in human languages, there's English, there's Spanish, there's German, there's Portuguese, there's others. In, in machine language, we've also got polyglot of languages, Java, Python, COBOL, C++, uh, you know, on the hardware side, Verilog, VHDL, System C, System Verilog, and so on. And in terms of vocabulary, in human languages, I've got words, nouns, pronouns. In terms of machines uh, and code as a language, I've got variables, functions, classes, da -da -da, all modules, so on. Um, in terms of syntax, I have these commas, full stop, exclamation mark, uh, and so on. In machines, I've got uh, symbols as well for representing syntax. But I think, you know, obviously, what is really important is the context for language understanding. So there is one big difference between the two, which is uh, really human uh, machine language is executable. You can execute it, you can give it some inputs, and you can get some precise outputs versus human language, which is not a formal runtime model. There is no formal runtime model associated with human. Uh, one way, act, one could argue, hey, actions are my outputs, actually. But there's no formal mechanism for dealing with that model, unlike, you know, sort of computer science and machines, the language of machines and code and programming languages. There's a very formal control data flow graph computational model associated with it. And we can use that to reason and make the language understanding, the code language understanding very powerful with the symbolic uh, learning that we have had for NLP kind of techniques combined with this uh, really uh, program analysis based techniques. And this combination can be the one that is most powerful. So at IBM, we've been working towards something that is you know, very disciplined in terms of how we understand code. Um, you know, at the bottom is the data layer, at the right above it is basically, you know, our data sets and source repo analysis and masking and redaction techniques. Uh, right above that are uh, representations. So we have intermediate representations, application topology discovery, data discovery, rule-based models. Um, then we have obviously NLP inspired large foundational models, code and, and text embeddings and transformer models also known as foundational model these days, uh, things like GPT and others, um, as uh, some of you uh, may have already been playing with. Then, then we have task-specific AI models, for example, doing COBOL to Java, or for example, doing um, uh, generating scripts in a particular area. And then we have a broad set of capability on understanding uh, code, reviewing code, retrieving and generating code, and testing and verifying code, and a whole bunch of applications that lie above it, all really underpinned with in parallel explainable AI right along with it as well. And you know, if I really go, go look at sort of the software developer pain points, um, which actually holds true for both hardware developers who actually are at the behavioral and the logic level. Um, it's really on, obviously, uh, you know, a lot of pain points. If I say things that are critical and urgent, it's about end-to-end -end testing and staging and deployment. It's about quality of, of that uh, code that you are developing. 
um, it's about efficiency, the resource efficiency. Um, it's about really how do you maintain your code? How do you progress your code? How do you deploy your code and so on? And obviously security is becoming more and more, and more of an important area. Uh, so I, I'm going to skip some of this in the spirit of time, uh, but because I want to really focus on a demo as well, um, because all of this will become more clear through a demo uh, than than through anything else. And that's why I, I actually, these slides will be available for you to take a look at in your uh, sort of uh, spare time, uh, because it's really about how AI can help me as a developer. Uh, to really re retrieve the right stuff, to improve the stuff I'm doing. Either I'm a hardware developer or software developer. By hardware developer, I really mean in this case, specifying software for hardware. And I'm going to show you some of the things, as I said earlier on as well. Okay, so I, I really think, I think one of the things that we've been focused on, um, as I talked about very much earlier is, um, you know, really, applications from a software point of view have become quite antiquated. And application modernization is a multi-billion dollar, actually, roughly speaking, just from a COBOL point of view, um, there are roughly speaking 220 lines of, uh, 220 billion lines of COBOL in the world. Um, and it, you know, just to give you a measure of how big a problem that is, that it costs roughly 50 cents a line to get uh, things translated to a more modern language. So uh, that's a $110 billion problem or $110 billion opportunity. Uh, and we have been focusing a lot on it uh, in terms of uh, just that modernizing that legacy code, uh, analyzing that code and, and you, you know, using AI to help modernizing modernize that code. This was, again, I don't want to delve into this too much, but this was a, a large client, a large automotive client we took. They were really taking that legacy application, struggling with it. It was a $200 million asset. Asset, I mean software asset for them. Uh, 3,500 plus Java files, more than a million lines of code. Uh, code written over generations of, of Java uh, technology from Struts to Jaxby and SOAP and others. Um, over a year of ongoing manual migration effort to a more modern version of uh, of uh, Java, uh, unable to do that, uh, you know, restructuring that uh, into microservices as well, cloud native implementation. The work we've been doing on AI and and really analyze code, help code, modernize code. We were able to take that and really modernize that in four weeks versus a year, uh, where the uh, we we converted that into twenty five plus per partitions, microservices consisting of 450 plus class um, with the leveraging runtime and data dependency analysis and so on. So I think this is, I wanted to show you this is real. This is here today, actually. So at this point, I want to go to actually a demo uh, so that you can really see the, the, the power of some of these things. So just give me a minute, see if, if I can bring it up. Okay, so just give me a minute. I'll stop sharing just for a minute, and then uh, uh, I'm going to share again, uh, if I may. All right. Okay, so let's do this. Uh, I'm gonna go here quickly, uh, see if I can share the screen again. Uh, StreamYard. All right, let's see, share, share screen, share screen, share. Okay. So I'm, just to give you a context, I'm on something that all of you can access as well. This is not something proprietary. If you go, um, many of you will be familiar with OpenAI um, and um, you know, very innovative organization. They've been actually at the, at the forefront of uh, innovating on these very large language models. Um, models like Lambda that you saw from news from Google recently. Um, and these very large language models are becoming phenomenally powerful, actually, to the point they're becoming mind-blowing, actually, I would say. Uh, and and uh, 
if I look, look at, uh, if you go to a, so they more recently, um, so late last year, released a version for uh, these uh, transformer models of very large models, which are hundreds and billions of parameters uh, for a version for code called Codex. So I'm running that version here right now. I have a bunch of, you know, this called Playground. So I'm just going to ask it to, you know, just, just ask it uh, to code. I just sort of, <coughs> I did this something very simple. I had write Java code to read a file with a list of names, their phone numbers, their zip codes, annual income, and colleges they go to. Print all the names that attend. I'm even having some spelling mistake that attend Columbia University and earn more than two hundred fifty thousand dollars and live in zip code one zero five eight nine. Now sort these names in alphabetical order. Okay, so I just like you know I'm trying to code something. I just ask it some. You know, I'm interacting with it in English actually. So I just say submit. Let's see what happens. There you go. So let me just specify again, actually. So just to make sure you 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 actually understand. So what I asked was the list of names, uh, uh, and the and the list has uh, you know a list of names, their phone numbers, so phone numbers, zip codes, annual income, and colleges. So you can see there's name, there is phone number, there's zip, there's income, and there's college. So it's actually did a did a scan. So there's a scanner. It did a scan. So it passed the input, uh, and then it says if college equals Columbia and um, income is greater than two hundred fifty thousand, and the zip code equals this, you know, add the name to the name list, and then you say sort the names. It's perfect. This is great. I, I, and interestingly, it has never seen that before because I typed it. Interestingly, it's not like I cut and pasted from web somewhere so it may have seen it. I just typed that. So it actually did that for you automatically. Now I say, okay, well, I, I am going to try something more interesting, actually, and say, uh, and uh, filter names that are female sounding, just as an example. Let's see what it does, actually. Um, so let's see. Uh, working? Working? See. So this actually, interestingly, and... and uh, it actually, what it did was it said, if the name ends in a vowel, it is, and in, in, this is true in certain cultures, specifically in kind of English culture. If the name ends with a vowel, it is uh, highly likely that the name will be a, a female sounding name. That doesn't hold true for every culture, by the way. So there's obviously, there's data bias that comes in. And this is the, one of the things I wanted to highlight, that you can blindly trust, trust these things. But my point is that these things are becoming phenomenal enough to the point that they are just mind blowing, actually. Now, just the very fact that you can do this, uh, and I, I'm going to show you some VHDL examples too. Interestingly, actually, that you would know this stuff is real. This is not just PowerPoint stuff that uh, you know is 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 not coming to a to a uh, theater near you or to a to a, a uh, Mac or a or your laptop near you. Let me take another one. Actually, you know, I talked a lot about COBOL, so I actually, interestingly, this is. This is part of one of the, the applications that we have. I copied some code. So here is some COBOL. Most people won't understand actually COBOL. And I don't to blame them for it because most people have never seen it. This is a COBOL program, part of one of the applications we have internally in IBM. So this is real code, actually. So this is not just some cooked up code. I say, OK, uh, can you do convert this? Uh, um, this COBOL code to Java. OK, so let's see what it does. So let, let it think. There you go. You see this code right here? This is actually converting that into Java. That's wonderful. Interestingly, it has never seen that code as well. Uh, because that code was in a private repository we had. It's not something we copied from somewhere, actually. Uh, now, interestingly, I could do something very interesting. I say, use that as input. And I say, um, uh, improve the performance of this Java code. Let's say that. 
that's what it does see what it did was it actually you know there, there was a bunch of operations i was using an intermediate variable it actually <coughs> used a optimized math library function it called that up and and it actually put that sort of within the print so i'm not using this intermediate variable translation here and there and it actually did that automatically again although it's a very simple function but i think what i'm trying to tell you is also many of you would have watched more recently microsoft and github announced ga general availability of copilot as well and that actually automatically recommends functions to you does code completions all kind of really impressive stuff and what i want to challenge this community to is that revolution is taking place in software today as we speak actually that revolution must come to a hardware soft, sort of a hardware programmer as well because why should we be left behind in terms of all this productivity and beautiful revolution taking place so let it, let us see what you know where a model like gpt codex uh, what it can do for me if i if i ask it hardware actually so let's see um and i'm just thinking out loud at this point and say um can you uh, convey how to can you show how to code uh, an ALU in, let's say VHDF, let's say that. Uh, and I haven't tried this, just to be fair. I don't know how it'll, well it'll work. I really haven't tried this particular one. There you go. Here's the ALU. Now, one may argue that it may have seen this somewhere, so it picked it up. That's okay. Let's see. Treat that as input. Okay. I said, okay, that's VHDL. Let's treat that as input. Uh, can you translate that to, okay, I saw it rather than say, can you, I just say, translate that to Verilog. Okay, let's see. There you go. And I can do that for many other hardware constructs too. I think my point is following. There is a massive revolution taking place in AI disrupting software engineering. And I believe AI needs to disrupt and help. We as sort of software developers in the hardware area, both in terms of programming, C, C++, Java, whatever it might be, as well as hardware programming as well, because that revolution must come to a hardware programmer as well. And I think we are starting to see sort of snippets of it but so i've been working with uh, with andrew kang uh, who actually leads one of the national ai center for optimization uh, folks from mit and others as well in really spearheading our community towards that direction and more recently you have seen some work in from google and others on ai helping like for example floor planning and chip layout and others but I believe there is a massive revolution to be had in terms of AI really engineering the future of software and hardware and how software and hardware are specified and how they are designed as well. So I think I'm just going to stop on this demo and maybe take a few questions, Ricardo. I'm going to stop sharing my screen at this point and, and really take any questions that you, you might have. All right. All right, so uh, uh, if you have any questions, please uh, use uh, the chat channel to do it. I'm not seeing any question now, but uh, I have one. Uh, so uh, I, I nowadays uh, I think that uh, the, the in the hardware we are using much more transistor than is needed. So AI can uh, help to optimize and to have uh, uh, more uh, mainly optimization related to power consumption and also connections. Yeah, so uh, absolutely right, Ricardo. And and this was the work, some of the work that uh, you know has been done in the in the community, whether it is Dream Place or. Uh, or the work that was done by uh, by Google and others as well. And uh, we at IBM have been working on that significantly too. In terms of data-driven approaches, 
to power optimization, data-driven approaches to circuit optimization, and data-driven approaches to um, sort of layout optimization as well. And you know, one of the work which uh, I think Google work, it was published in, in Nature magazine too, has caught a lot of attention, both some controversial one or otherwise too, uh, which, I, but I believe data-driven techniques have a significant role to play as we move forward, but sort of, again, merged with in these kind of areas, very much like software, where we have a decades of history of optimization. This is not like human language. Again, this is slightly different because we have a very deep understanding of that problem. Uh, so we have developed these uh, optimization techniques for decades and decades. You know, design automation conference itself is uh, you know, five decades old, actually. So um, uh, we have been working on that area for long. And I believe these data-driven learning techniques with deep learning and others, when merged with the techniques, um, which are more uh, you know, traditional optimization techniques, can make these traditional optimization techniques much more powerful, resulting in significant quality improvements in terms of power consumption, in terms of timing uh, and performance, and in terms of area uh, of these designs as well from a hardware point of view. And it's a very, very sort of active and, and a rich area for research. Yeah. So thank you. So we have a question by Clayton Farias. Do you think this AI technology will be used in secret design more Frequently, I think you already answered this, but I would. Uh, so, Clayton, uh, excellent question. And yes, I definitely believe AI technology will be used in circuit design more frequently as we progress in multiple ways, I would say. One is to make the circuit design better themselves. Second way it will be used will be to make the job of the circuit designers easier. By that, I mean making them more productive. They do a lot of mundane things, actually, helping them find the right constructs. Hey, I've, somebody somewhere has worked on that adder before or that multiplier that was cool. Somebody has improved the performance of the circuit before. Right now, there is no way of sort of really going through all that massive amount of dat data that may exist in a corporation like IBM, like Intel, like Google or others, and really you know, make sense of it and make recommendations. That's another way where AI will help make the job of a, not just make circuit design better, but make the job of a circuit designer more productive, fruitful, and happier. Thank you. So now a question by Julio, Julio Torres Tello. Is this going to leave programmers without jobs? <laughs> Probably not, but what's the next role of programmers going to be? Yeah, I, I expected that question, actually, uh, because I, I get that a lot. Uh, no, no, not at all. In fact, I would. Uh, my typical answer to this is, uh, you know, human race has been on an automation journey since its beginnings. When, when the wheel was invented, it potentially took somebody's job away who was carrying weight on their back. Uh, interestingly, but it has enabled many other jobs that came along with it. And I believe... Uh, it's going to make your job as a, you know, there are not enough programmers to go around for the role that software is playing in the world. There are not enough programmers to go around. Uh, your job will become a lot more productive and fruitful versus doing things that are a lot more mundane. Actually, the, the things that you don't enjoy in your job, uh, so some of the automated uh, agents, if I may say it that way, will be able to do for you. But where it is not able to really come even close to what you are doing is creativity. Uh, that part, it, it, it will not be able to match, but it will be able to make the recommendations for you, search the right things for you. And, you know, just like uh, saying, does the invention of synthesis technology took away designer's job? Not at all, actually. A lot more people were doing design. And a lot more designers were needed, actually. So I, I don't think so that 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 is not my worry at all, actually. Uh, my, my worry is trying to be fearful of this technology and not be able to employ it. And this is kind of this is my mission to make it ease in for people to say, you know, this is here to help rather than it's going to take away our jobs in any way. Thank you. 
So now a question here, first a comment of, uh, by Elias Ramos, neural networks are computational versions of system of differential equations. Some are sensitive to their initial values. Uh, how to trust the result of deep learning if something of this nature can happen, some work in, that, in this direction? Yeah, so I think what you are really pointing out an excellent question on reproducibility of the results. Now, in certain areas, so I'll say it the following way. If many of you are familiar with parallel algorithms, parallel and distributed algorithms, not all of them are reproducible, by the way. Uh, even in, in when we do floor planning and when we do wiring, uh, for the tools that we run today, I know this actually for sure. Uh, you run the same thing, same data again, you're going to get you're gonna get pretty much the same result, overall quality. But one connection may be here, one connection may be there. It has some uncertainty because how you you form you sort of uh, uh, farm it out in various parallel machines sometimes hundreds of machines and then you kind of assemble it together and how that synchronization happens depends on the state of that machine at that point in time uh, so there is some what is known as non determinism in algorithms that exist today that we have learned to adapt very well having said that in certain scenarios what you are pointing out um, you know for example loan approval I don't want, you know, everything was same. Somehow my loan was approved today and was denied tomorrow. Well, like, really, I don't care whether your overall no numbers were 21.2% of loan approval. I don't care because I got screwed somehow. So in those scenarios, you need more deterministic kind of technologies where I can ensure that the, the results are reproducible and certain things happen, which is needed for trust of AI in those scenarios. There are other scenarios where, yes, it mathematically holds true, but you could be more forgiving because we have learned to deal with that non-determinism as part of our design flows. So there is no single answer for this um, per se, but I think overall you see what, what, where I'm getting to at. Thank you. Now a question by Professor Altamira Suzin. Thanks for the nice presentation. We are seeing machine answering. How do quality of questions relate to quality of answer? Ah, excellent question. So, uh, so uh, Altamaro, there is a, a, I'm going to point you to an area. This is actually related to the kind of models I was showing and the demo I was showing. If you look at uh, uh, questions, so there is a whole area which has become very active area of research recently called prompt engineering. How do you prompt these machines so that your answers are good? And interestingly, AI itself has, is being applied to uh, what kind of prompt should I give? So it learns how to prompt as well. Uh, so it learns how to pose good questions so that you can get good answers from these machines. That area is called prompt engineering and automated prompt engineering is another area, but just Google it. You will see it actually GPT models or transformer models and prompt engineering. You will see lots of work in this area. Okay, thank you. So now a question by Professor Rafael Garibotti. Can we use this tool as HLS, as C2 VGDL? I would, I would say, um, Rafael, not yet, because it's not designed for that. And for doing something like that, we will need to build sort of our own specific models. Could we use technology like this? Absolutely, yes, exactly. And I would. My goal is to encourage this community to move, start moving towards that direction. Uh, to you know, I showed the kind of VHDL, Verilog, Cobol, Java, uh, C, potentially VHDL. Now, obviously, there are transformation involved in that path. We've been working on that technology for long on high-level synthesis. <coughs> so I believe, very similar to the answer I gave earlier. Those set of technologies on high-level synthesis combined with more data-driven technologies as the right way to proceed versus only relying on one versus other. Thank you. So now a question by Professor Claudio Diniz. Thank you for the excellent talk, Dr. Puri. Is this technology will bridge the gap of open software developed positions? When do you think it will happen? happen? Uh, it's, 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 it's an excellent point. And in fact, I'll give you a data point, Claudio. 
Um, more recently, it was reported when uh, when GitHub actually uh, announced the general availability of Copilot um, that Copilot is helping. Uh, they actually did a pilot study on this. Is helping um, uh, sort of save for certain developer tasks. They didn't do it on all of them, forty percent of the time. Uh, so is it helping bridge the gap of open software developer positions? In some ways, yes, because it is making people more productive. Thereby, they could do other things in their time. And it's bridging that gap uh, between the need for software skills and the demand of software skills by making people more productive. Um, I believe, I think, the, the, the demand for software and, and software positions is almost insatiable, given the role technology is playing in our world, and it has only been accelerated by the digital revolution we are in the middle of, accelerated almost 10x in last two years, because everything became digital. Everything was online, actually. <coughs> so in some ways, it is already happening, and I, I believe it will just continue to accelerate. Thank you. So now a question by Fernando Carrion. Thanks for the nice talk. Do you believe this revolution could reduce uh, productivity gap between analog digital design or it's most likely to increase this gap? <coughs> I would say I think analog design is a is a we haven't cracked that nut. Um, from an automation point of view, even with traditional algorithms as much yet. So we need to, if I were to just answer it more intuitively, I would say it'll, it'll potentially increase that gap um, because there are not that many subject matter experts on the analog design available yet for me to be able to automate it that easily. I know there's a lot of work going on in the community in that area. Um, again, I would, I would, leave that a little bit open for the time being. I've worked in analog area as well. The, like I wrote a paper more recently, a uh, couple of years back related to deep learning and, and analog design, but I would I would say we will see. We will see. I, I don't know the answer to it yet. I really don't. Know. So thank you. So a uh, question by Daniel. How can code Da Vinci be used to make sure the code specification is complete and accurate yeah so the uh, another excellent question daniel and i would say so there is there is a whole area of how do you fine tune these models how do you fine tune on top of these models because the world doesn't have access to these models directly some of them you do because they're open source and you can go on hugging face uh, there's a company called hugging face which is really revolutionizing this open um, um, open movement uh, and you can download some of these models, but the most powerful ones are not available, but they can be fine-tuned. There is a way of fine-tuning on top of this with the data that you have, which is which will make your task more, if I may say, enterprise-ready, more production-ready. Right now, it's very cool. It's like, wow, it can do that. And I hope some of you were wowed regarding, like, I'm impressed. It could do that, actually. I didn't imagine it could do that. And... We need to move from, wow, it can do that, to I can rely on it. And that gap is filled by that fine tuning for that particular task. And we are focused ourselves on certain tasks like Cobalt to Java, uh, other things, uh, to make these models powerful enough so that they can make the specifications complete and correct. Thank you. So a question by Alcides Costa. Fascinating presentation, Dr. Puri. How this system behaves when request optimize systems. For example, Mr. AI, please could you design to me two different address optimized for power in Verilog? So interestingly, uh, hmm. I see this, I would say I actually did try and I was surprised with the result. I said, I, I had a gate level implementation and I said, optimize this for timing. And it actually did optimize it. it. It actually moved the signal. Now, I'm sure it found that data somewhere else. It has no notion of, just keep in mind what it is and what it is not. It has no notion of circuits and like it really doesn't know what that circuit actually means. 
it's more like i have seen something like this before when that question was answered something like this was done before it's more on patterns it learns to extract those patterns and this is where i say we need to combine technologies like this with sort of very detailed understanding we have of logic design optimization power that area and that combination is an amazingly rich area for us to play in uh, i think nobody should take the impression this is kind of a silver bullet it's not it's not but i think it is fascinating enough to say the move the needle from where we are to where we could be actually thank you so a uh, question by Christian, thank you, Dr. Puri, for this excellent presentation. How is it possible to AI, AI replicate <laughs> human behavior? I, I actually, I, it'll get philosophical. I think this, uh, you know, what is human behavior? It's, uh, it's going to get into that. So I'm sure this is a good, this is a good question for a beer debate. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> I would like to size to sidestep this question. Okay, thank you. So I'm seeing no more questions here in the chat. So thank you very much for you. And uh, thank you very much for this very excellent uh, talk. So um, I hope to see you in, in person in a new future. I so do thank too. Thank you very much again.